um, less than one year ago in, in Brazil, in Brumadinho, um, a storage facility raged and killed over 250 people. It was clear uh, in, the, in, 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 the, in, in the few days after uh, this event to the companies organized in ICMM, the, the time was come to make a step change in management this problem. Uh, Tailing storage facility and their accident have a long history in, in mining activity uh, for decades are regularly producing accidents, tragedies, casualties in the communities around and amongst the employees of the mining. And this is a, a and this is a, a, a characteristic or a problem uh, of the of mining uh, activities that it is less and less accepted by the stakeholders groups around the mining activity. It is not accepted anymore um, by the communities. It is uh, not accepted by regulators. It is not accepted by investors. Uh, all these three groups, of course, are aware that we have to continue mining, that uh, natural resources, uh, the substances that are extracted are uh, the fuels that are uh, allowing our socioeconomic system to deliver the, um, the world that we want, the sustainable development goals, and, um, and that mining activity will continue and will uh, grow in the next decades. Uh, but they are aware and they are requiring that these mining activities uh, have to change, have to improve, have to develop into something safer, more sustainable, and more fair. This is the reason because uh, um, the mining companies decided from the first moment to partner together with, uh, with other organizations. With UNEP on one side, United Nations Environmental Program, representing the public space around uh, mining activity, community states, and with PRI, Principal Resp Responsible Investment, that is representing the part of investors that are requiring impact positive impact and won't avoid uh, negative headlines and negative image um, for their, for their investi investments. Uh, the, the three co-conveners joined forces, decided to um, ask me to chair the process, uh, granted me with independence and with the ability to convey a group of experts that is actually writing on the standard uh, to convey an advisory board with more than 20 people representing the different constituencies around the mining, the, the mining activities and bringing the wishes, the concerns, the feedbacks of the stakeholder groups. The expert panel itself is uh, representing or is uh, bringing together different disciplines and different knowledge uh, systems we have engineers skilled and specialized in uh, tailings, uh, in tailing storage facility construction and supervision. We have sociologists uh, with knowledge and experience in the relation between mining activities and, and communities around. We have lawyers uh, on uh, environmental law and regulation of um, of tailings activity, uh, environmentalists uh, looking since decades on this relation to the environment, and um, specialists in um, organizational issues inside big companies that bring the insight coming from banking, from aviation to the mining industry. Um, this expert panel has spent the last four months, five months almost, in drafting a first version of the standard. Um, it's possible to have displayed the, um, the timetable. Yeah. 
Here you see the timetable of, of the project. Um, June till the end of October, um, the uh, creation of the draft uh, standard, followed by two months of consultation. The result of this consultation will be then incorporated into the, into the standard draft to produce a final, a final standard that will be discussed with the three co-conveners and so is the plan launched in March 2020. The central piece, as you see in the, in, in the, in the, in the image, is the consultation. Uh, the consultation that is carried on out in uh, um, online on one side, uh, engaging with a portal uh, under the globaltailingsreview.org, and on the other side, in person, um, engaging with communities, local regulators, um, mining companies at different places around, around the world. This consultation is, is at the center of the of the, uh, the project, not only because it is, uh, from, the, from, from a time point of view, um, the, the middle phase of the project, it is also the activity that guarantee the uh, trust, or is looking for the trust of the different stakeholders. Um, a standard can, will be, will be, um, will be searched and companies will be uh, asking for certification on the standard because being certified under the standard means a value for the companies. And this value is if the standard, if the certification, if trusted by third parties, is trusted by communities, regulators, investors, insurers, if this will make the life and the operation of the mining industry easier. To guarantee this trust, uh, we have to listen to these different stakeholder groups, to take their concern on board, to give answer to their, to their feedbacks, and this is the sense of these consultations. We are, uh, we are almost at the end of the, of the consultation period. We will close the consultation at the end of December, and it is great having you all here for this discussion. We will ask you, of course, to engage also in written in the, in the consultation. Um, we will display at the end of this, uh, of this webinar uh, the, the, the picture of the, of the portal where we can, we can engage. Um, but for the, for the moment, thank you for being here. Thank you for your engagement, for your question. And um, I will end here. And if you have question now at the higher level, please, please ask them now. Hi, everybody. If you do have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to let you know that this call is also being recorded and will be available on our website, on the GTR website in the coming days. Uh, so if you want to, to listen back at any point, that will be available. Um, there aren't any questions so far, so I will hand over now to Angela Cooper, who is on the expert panel, for to, so she can provide an overview of the standard. Yes, hello. Um, I would assume that most of you would have read the draft, so this is just going to be a, a quick overview. Uh, the standards uh, is divided into six topics. And under each topic, there are a number of principles, uh, and under each principle, a number of requirements. So the, the key topics co cover the knowledge base, affected communities, and there is a technical part on design, construction, operation, monitoring, and closure, uh, followed by uh, management and governance, and a section on emergency response, and finally, a, a topic on public disclosure and access to information. Um, so as a brief overview, the knowledge base um, includes um, uh, a number of, of issues. 
uh, with the intent that the knowledge be complete, updated, and integrated in, uh, in management activities. Um, on the affected communities, the focus is on human rights, due diligence, meaningful engagement of communities, and the establishment of grievance mechanisms. Uh, the design, construction, development of uh, the tailings facilities has the objective of creating a robust design uh, for minimizing risk across the life cycle of the tailings facility. Um, in, for the management and governance topic, the focus is on defining roles and resp responsibilities and helping establish a culture of learning and early problem recognition. So a feedback from um, the performance of the structure is embedded into uh, the operation in the facility and uh, also a systematic response to concerns raised internally and externally. Uh, the emergency response topic focuses on developing a local level of emergency preparedness, as well as a plan for long-term recovery of the community in case of a, of a disaster. And the disclosure topic focuses on uh, public access for information and a global transparency initiatives. So under knowledge base, um, the principles uh, relates to developing and keeping updated a knowledge base that supports the safe management of the tennis facility and an integration of the social, economic, environmental, and technical information uh, to select the site and the technologies to minimize risk. Uh, the affected communities topic, as mentioned before, focus on a requirement for human rights uh, diligence and meaningful engagement of people. So on the, on the technical topic of design, construction, operation, monitoring, and closing, there are a number of requirements here. So the one of them, um, is the concept of designing uh, and constructing and operating all tailings facilities with the presumption that the consequence classification is extreme. So that means adopting a design criteria for extreme. Uh, and the intent of this is that the, those facilities may have a very long life cycle so uh, we talk about 500 years for closure, potentially more. So eventually there could be more people downstream. Eventually the consequence classification may change. So it's just to promote a proactive approach to look at what it would take to design for extreme, what it would take um, for the closure scenario, if not even the operation, for the facilities with a longer service life uh, to accommodate potential changes uh, downstream, which may be out of control for the mining operator. And the other principles um, relates to developing a robust design and adopting a design criteria and op building and operating, all with a focus of minimizing risk. And associated with that, the design and implementation of, of a monitoring system that allows a performance-based management of each facility. Uh, on uh, management and governance, um, defines a number of key roles, essential systems, and critical processes. Uh, so, with a number of principles uh, that have the intention of um, elevating the decision-making responsibility, uh, establishing roles, uh, functions, and accountabilities 
Hospital supports um, the integrity of the facility, several levels of review, appointing and empowering an engineer of records, uh, developing an organizational culture that promotes learning, and uh, responding promptly to concerns, complaints, and grievances. Uh, emergency response, I guess that speaks for itself. It's, um, we mentioned that already. And uh, public disclosure and access to information um, focus on transparency uh, and making information accessible uh, to inform internal and external stakeholders about the risks and impacts of, of the tennis facilities. So that's a, a brief overview of the six topics. Thank you, Angela. If, if anybody has any questions, a reminder to use the Q&A function or, or um, raise your hand so that we, we know that one is coming. <laughs> um, we'll just pause for a moment to allow some time. Well, we'll move on and uh, talk just about the consultation process and um, in the meantime please continue to to submit your questions if you have one so the consultation will remain open until the 31st of December after which the feedback will be reviewed and, and analyzed um, and potentially incorporated into the standard one of the deliverables of the um, consultation is a cons consultation report which will provide an analysis of the data and how any feedback was incorporated. As ever, we have two strains of consultation with this being the, the last interactive event on our schedule. The online consultation portal is the primary mechanism for collecting feedback and we strongly encourage you to make your say there. The online portal will allow you to make comment on each, each or any of the individual requirements as you wish. It will also allow you the opportunity to attach a file or a letter or, or similar um, feedback in an unstructured format. And ultimately, you can also um, send an email to um, the consultation at globaltailingsreview.org. So as a reminder, that closes on the 31st of December and um, we encourage you to make your submissions known there. We have received what, a question, which I will pose to Bruno Oberle. Bruno, governance of the standard will be very important. What kind of governance model will be utilized? The, the, <clears throat> the way in which the standard will be implemented is not part of this uh, of the current project but of course we had to have a picture in mind how it could be implemented and what we what we suggest to refer to is another standard that is very well known in the mining sector and it is the cyanide code uh, the, 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 the governance of the cyanide code is um, as follow um, it is a it is a um, it was funded and supervised by a board of, uh, um, of, of directors that represent different um, interest and point of view on the, on the activity on the field uh, regulated by the Cyanide Code. The Cyanide Code itself, um, the entity this is working, um, has on one side the task to develop the implementation documents. Um, uh, that are used by the companies and by the assessors to prepare um, to prepare the assessment. On the other side, the, 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 the entity, the Cyanide Code Institution, has to accredit assessors to decide on the result of um, the assessment and to display um, the result of this of the certification publicly. Um, it is a, a, a very small, agile organization that relies on, on, on the external experts 
there are hired by the by the different com uh, companies seeking for for certification. And on the other side, it, 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 it produces a robust governance in terms of quality of the process and in terms of consent of the, of the results. I personally could imagine that uh, um, a very similar structure could be as effective as it was in the case of the better management of, um, of cyanide. Um, bearing in mind that uh, this process to create this, the entity, to let the entity prepare for the certification, and then starting gathering experience uh, will take time. Um, in case of the cyanide code, uh, the steady state was uh, reached after 10 years. That means that after 10 years, the, the big bulk of the activity were certified under the, under the code and, was, and, and were then seeking a recertification after a couple of years. Um, this is a model of governance that have proven to work very well, and this um, is the, the model that we, we suggest um, to whoever will take over this work. Thank you, Bruno. Um, we have a, a unique opportunity today in that we have a number of our expert panel available to answer your questions. So that the next question I will pass to Andrew Hopkins, and it reads: Accountability will be important. Ultimately, the board of directors of a company is responsible for all of the company's actions. Will the board of directors be directly responsible for the safety of tailings dams? This is a question we wrestle with in, the, in our group. Um, the answer is no, it won't be. Um, there will be an accountable executive who is um, a senior manager, but not necessarily uh, having any con direct connection with the board. The board, of course, is in a general sense um, accountable, but not um, not in any specific sense in this standard as it is currently drafted. If you would like to make a recommendation on this point or disagree with the requirements that we have in the standard, please um, make those comments um, in the online consultation. We'd be very happy to accept them. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we have had another question just about scheduling of of these um, webinars. And so just to clarify that the event that's currently happening is Vancouver time, 4.30 p.m. on the 16th, which of course spills into the 17th in the UK. So just to clarify. Um, if we have any, um, any further questions at this point, we will happily answer them. Um, I'll just pause a moment to allow any Additional, just a reminder, we have uh, many of our expert panel in the room at the moment, so now's your opportunity. Okay, thank you. Um, a lengthy comment or question regarding dam classification. Note that the main body of the text says that dam classification is to be based on credible failure modes, while the annex says that the classification is to be assessed independently of its probability of failure. From a dam design perspective, we typically develop the dam classification without accounting for the probability of failure since we are trying to represent the importance of the hazard that is being contained. By saying that the dam classification is to be based on credible failure modes, there is a potential for misapplication whereby the designer may rule out failure modes that should be credible in an effort to achieve a low classification. How do we reconcile this? So the intent um, of saying that uh, the classification uh, is based on credible failure modes is to say that the classification is based on the dam break study. So the area that will be affected uh, as the various uh, columns on the consequence classification table relates to the area that could be affected by the dam break. Um, 
so the dam break um, sometimes, especially in the past, has been done with the assumption that the entire dam suddenly vaporizes. So the intent is just to raise the bar a little bit on dam break studies and, and make them um, more related, you know, with the simplifications that are still required, um, related to credible failure modes. Uh, it continues to be the intent um, that it's not related to the probability of failure. Thanks, Angela. A question for Bruno, I suspect. What may be done to encourage adoption of the standard by companies that are not members of ICMM? The company will have an interest to, uh, to look for a certification, to seek certification under the standard, if, this, um, if the standard is delivering, delivering value um, to it. Uh, value can be delivered in, in, different, in different ways. One way is that, is, um, that we are discussing with a specialist of the sector is, for example, um, in, the, in, 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 the, in the sector of ensuring the activities around the tailings. Today, the possibility to be ensured, uh, to ensure the activity, the tailing storage facility is limited and very expensive. It is so because uh, um, th there, is, there is not a standardized way to deal with this, uh, with this issue each facility have to be assessed as uh, on itself and the, um, the, 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 the likelihood um, to have the right forecast um, for the calculation of the polys is uh, so low that the overhead, the risk component of the polys will be very high. So um, we are in discussion with specialists of the insurance sector that tell us if such a standard would be there and the company would be certified under the standard, they could rely to the standard as part of the police and deliver more standardized, more, more cheaper police. This is one type of value that could be delivered, be delivered to, um, to a company that is certified. Another one is, uh, um, is value in terms of better access to capital and investments. Um, if uh, investors, in institutionals and private investors would um, communicate that they will invest, uh, will prioritize investment in the mining sector into companies that are certified under the standard because they are linked with a, a, a smaller risk of failure. Um, this will be resulting in better access and cheaper money um, to be invested in, the, in, in, in that facility. Or a last one, an ultimative one, it can be that at one moment, and we have some signal, signal in that direction, that at one moment, public regulators, local authorities will require uh, companies to be certified under the standard um, to be granted to operate in a specific, in a specific country. Um, there are a lot of value that the standard has uh, can provide, and of course it is uh, based on the technical, uh, so the, the technical um, soundness of the standard and on the trust that is, uh, the standard is, uh, um, is, uh, is given to. Thank you, Bruno. Um, I might just go back to a question that was connected to an earlier question on, on um, credible failure modes, etc. So the follow-up question to Angela is, um, so this is focusing on the credible outcome of a failure, not the credibility of the failure mode itself. If so, then this should be clarified. Yeah, I'm not sure if I fully understand this comment, but we'll take another look at the wording in the standard and uh, try to make it uh, very clear. But if there are suggestions, um, we would be happy to receive them. Thank you. The next question is, the board of the ICMI is at this point in time self-appointing. Can the board of the Global Tailings Standard be more open to representatives of all segments of society? Mm 
so if I understand right the question, it is uh, again on the um, on the entity that will take over the implementation of the standard in future. Um, it could. I, I mean, there is nothing against. I would strongly recommend to uh, to have a broad representation uh, in the governance of this uh, of this institution and this entity because this will reinforce the trust. In my eyes, there are at least the, uh, there are a couple of stakeholders that would have to be represented. I would I would um, I would imagine that. Um, the mining sector itself, it will be will have to be represented there. I imagine that investors will be will have to be represented. I imagine that the interest of local communities will have to be uh, represented, and I imagine that special cases uh, will be additionally represented in that in that board. We had, for example, interesting discussion in China. Um, a standard has on one side will deliver safety, huh? right? It will make the, the management of the tailings uh, more safer. On the other side, because it is global, the, the, the world's global uh, uh, standard, um, it's an important one because, uh, of course, being, being, uh, being certified under the standard will cost uh, something because uh, because uh, practice, because the construction of the of the facility, um, the management will be um, slightly more complex than today, and this could prevent companies to take over this additional this additional burden. On the other side, if these requirements are evenly distributed, globally distributed, if all companies will engage, or a large majority of the companies will engage with the standard. This problem will no more will no more be existing. The standard have also the objective in mind to create to level playing fields for all the companies uh, uh, acting, extracting, and delivering raw material. And this is important that it is over the normal. OECD, let's say OECD oriented world, Western world. It is important that the standard will be recognized also, for example, in China, that it would be recognized in Russia, that it would be recognized in, uh, in, in some part of India. And this will probably go um, if we accept in the governance of, uh, of, the, of the standard, also representative of these part of the world with their specific concern and specific um, type of access to, this, uh, to these issues. Thank you. Um, our next question is, why would the standard be adopted in locations such as Western Australia when it is a lower standard than presently exists? So I'll, I'll hand over to Dirk Wenzel for this one. <clears throat> well, the, as Bruno just indicated, the idea of the uh, global standard is really to, to be applied on an international basis uh, to uh, all jurisdictions. And so uh, the idea that uh, there may be higher standards in specific places than is right now in the global, it's proposed global tailing standard, uh, it does not negate the global tailing standard. However, we would also be very interested in comments in this regard uh, to, to the whole process so that we can uh, pay attention to that in our next draft of the global standard. Thank you. And may I, may, may I add one comment to this one? But we, we were in Western Australia and we have spoken with the, with, with the ministry in charge of the regulation and the message we have gotten from, from there it is that they are interested in, this, in the standard and they could imagine taking elements that are not in their current legislation uh, in future in the legislation. We, we should probably engage more precisely in what, in, in which sense, uh, of which aspect the, the Western Australian legislation 
is more advanced uh, than the standard. And this is uh, we recognize that it is uh, we are not seeking the best uh, solution, but we uh, a solution that is achievable by a large majority of the operators, and in which regards the standard could be helping also in Western Australia. If I could add to that, I think one of our assumptions is that whenever there is legislation in an area and the standard is making similar statements about this area, always the local legislation will prevail. That's the starting point assumption. So why should Western Australia bother? Well, the answer would be we assume that the standard is addressing some things which the legislation is not, in which case the legislation often uh, call up the standard and in a sense um, adopt the standard in relation to those matters um, where the legislation is silent. That's really something for the, for the uh, regulators to work through. It's not something that we would need to work through. But we see no problem with um, legislation and the standard coexisting in that way. Thank you. Our next question is, catastrophic failure of tailings dam has led to financial liabilities in the hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more. Has the GTR considered requiring that mining companies have some sort of financial surety or insurance for catastrophic dam failures? For this, I'll hand over to Mark Scalacci. Thanks, Audrey. Um, first, let me, let me say that we've given a great deal of consideration to this issue, and we really would welcome comments uh, from folks about the, how we might uh, use these provisions uh, to deal with liabilities. But I want to note that this is not just a question of liabilities. That's a very important issue, I think. And, and certainly, when people suffer damages from catastrophic failures, there needs to be some ability to compensate those folks. But there's a really uh, more important, or at least another very important aspect of this, which is to try to incentivize uh, mining companies from avoiding failures in the first place. And so the um, expert panel has been talking a great deal about other kinds of financial assurances, uh, providing um, or requiring that, that companies provide assurance bonds that would help to ensure that uh, when a mine is closed, uh, that it's properly closed and, and that there is a, a fund of money available to assure closure in the event of bankruptcy or some other problem for, uh, uh, with respect to the mining company that is leaving the area. And also just to have uh, insurance companies and, and bonding companies available to help monitor the success of the operation of the mine. The insurance company clearly has a strong incentive to encourage a safe mining practices so that they don't suffer those liabilities. And, and insurance can provide a really important incentive to uh, avoid these kinds of catastrophic failures from happening in the first place. Thanks, Mark. The next question is, did the panel consider the concept of certification of the accountable executive, responsible tailings facility engineer, and engineer of record, similar to the certification accountants, lawyers, and doctors require, similar to the concept of professional structural engineers or professional tailings qualified persons? Uh, this is clearly something that will have to be addressed during the whole certification process. As uh, the ICMI in the cyanide code certification has a whole document available to specifically address the questions that must be considered for each of the, uh, in this case, the, the principles and the requirements. Similarly, one would do the same in terms of failing certification. And so, so this issue will have to be refined further during the development of the whole certification process. Thanks, Dirk. Our next question is, how long do you think it will take before a certification program is available for rollout to member companies? Again, this is not subject to the current project. Uh, so what I am saying now, uh, let's say the best case ba based on discussion um, we had with other um, similar um, similar um, activities. Uh, you have to create the entity. It, it will take, let's say, half a year. The entity will have, based on the standard and on, on the documents, 
uh, that will accompany the standard have to prepare implementing implementing documents. We'll have to accredit the first bunch of assessors. And um, uh, I, I, I could imagine that the first certification could start one year after the launch uh, of the standard in, in the best cases. And I mean start, not end with them, with the final certification. Thank you, Bruno. And just a follow-up comment to an earlier question to flag that please note a regulator cannot legally enforce or adopt a standard in Australia. Only a regulation or code of practice is enforceable. Um, I wonder if Peter's an Australian. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an Australian too, Peter. Um, look, you may know, know a little bit more about this than I do, but my understanding is that the the general requirement in, Aust in Australian legislation, including mining legislation, is that companies must do whatever is reasonably practicable to minimise risk. Now, it's, it's open to the regulator to say to, to companies, if you are in compliance with the standard, we will um, take it that you have done what is reasonably practicable to minimise risk. There are ways in which they can uh, adopt the standard as uh, a, a code in that sense. The precise legal, um, um, I guess, way in which it's done is not something that I, I'm fully familiar with, but I know that regulators can certainly do that. Thank you, Andrew. Um, we don't seem to have any further questions at, oh, one of the final. Um, so the standard will not just cost mining companies money to follow, but also qualified resources when it comes to staff, consultants, etc. will be required. To my knowledge, those resources are limited. My concern is, will the standard raise the level of the lowest operating mines, or will it raise the operators that are already at a high level? Should I try the first guess, and yeah. then you can continue? There, there, are, there are, in a way, two, um, so I, I see two, two different topic treated in this question. Um, I will address first the second part. Um, uh, the clear intention of the standard, um, it is not to make the, 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 the best even better, but to raise the general level of, um, of the operations. This is the reason because um, earlier in another, to another question I've said, we are not looking for the best available, available practice, but we are looking at good practice. Um, let's say, as a, as a picture, I, I would imagine the bar put in a way that 80% is are below and 20% uh, above, uh, so that uh, for the 80% would be the effort to get um, to get to become better. Um, so this is, let's say, more in general, specifically with relation of um, of shortages of personnel, staff, consultancies. We we, we are we are familiar uh, with this. We know that it is uh, there is a um, a big concern uh, around the world, not only in a specific region. Um, and we are, it is clear that if we demand companies to work on new standard and activity, um, this will demand more, uh, more personnel. And it is clear to us that the personnel has to be, has, has to become, has to be of a high quality. And, um, and there, there is, there will be no way um, if not to, grant specialists with more uh, perspective of careers, with better rewards of the, uh, of the heavy uh, burden of responsibility and work that they carry and in and asking university to, to do better. Uh, um, I, I will pass the, the word to Dirk van Ziel that knows this world very well and he, he can explain much more better. Well, thank you, I, I think the the concern of uh, limited resources is clearly an issue we're struggling with throughout the world today. And so uh, this is 
recognized and it's uh, something that will be addressed in the recommendations report as well. And, and so uh, it is, uh, I think, a concern for all tailings professionals uh, internationally. And one will have to make sure that it doesn't change the uh, evenness in which a global standard like this will finally be uh, applied. Thank you. Can I add a comment? Let me come closer. Um, <laughs> We're just handing over to Susan Joyce, another member of our expert panel. Yeah, just to mention that it was uh, flagged in several of the on-site consultations, the concern about the um, capacity building and training for the auditors, the people that will be doing the certifying, that, that should not be concentrated only in the Global North, and that there needs to be um, a focus on um, building capacity and building, um, you know, relevant um, um, uh, people with the relevant skills in a number of countries. Um, it is outside this scope of work, but it will be noted in the recommendation report um, that that uh, issue has been raised. Thank you, Susan. We have no further questions at this time, so I will close the call. Um, a final reminder that the recording of this session will be available on our website in the coming days, should any of your peers or colleagues wish to, to hear what you've just heard today. Thank you for your time and thank you for your questions. And please don't forget to give our, your feedback on the portal. Thank you.